When Superman Ride of Steel made its debut in the year 2000, it captivated roller coaster enthusiasts worldwide, gaining a well-deserved reputation as one of the world's greatest coasters. However, the ride encountered a series of unfortunate incidents, including a tragic accident resulting in the loss of a rider's life. This led to several unwanted modifications and changes to its identity that have left certain aspects of the ride diminished compared to its former glory. Under the name Superman the Ride Today, this once revered roller coaster has lost its unquestioning favorability with many enthusiasts. In this video, we will delve deep into the history of Superman the Ride, which may be more eventful than you imagined. We'll explore its past, ride experience, operational quirks and flaws, and why its accidents occurred. Now I cannot stress this enough, but for most of its existence, Superman the Ride has been a safe roller coaster, and riders face no danger when strapping in for a thrilling journey. So the next time you find yourself in Agawam, Massachusetts, make sure to experience the excitement of Superman the Ride. It remains one of my personal favorite roller coasters. If you enjoy the video as it plays, I ask that you show your support by clicking the like button, as it greatly helps the channel navigate the challenges of the YouTube algorithm. Now let's dive into the fascinating world of Superman the Ride, which you'll also hear me reference as Superman Ride of Steel, its original name, and Bizarro, its awkward middle phase name. Ironically, Superman the Ride's existence stems from a series of unwise decisions made by the Six Flags Entertainment Corporation, primarily driven by excessive spending. In the 1990s, Premier Parks, led by CEO Kieran E. Burke, began acquiring a long list of amusement parks across the United States, Mexico, and Europe. One of their 1996 purchases was Riverside Park in Agawam, Massachusetts which was later rebranded as Six Flags New England in 2000, coinciding with the introduction of Superman Ride of Steel. Upon acquisition, Riverside Park had a smaller collection of rides, maintaining a modest and charming family-owned atmosphere. Its history dates back to the mid-1800s when it served as a picnic area along the Connecticut River. Premier Parks purchased Riverside Park for $22.5 million US dollars and began installing record amounts of new installations. The park reopened in 1997 as Riverside the Great Escape, featuring $20 million of general improvements and new rides, which included a brand new entrance, a chance chaos, a Vacoma Air Jumper, a Shoot the Chutes water ride called Shipwreck Falls, a Vacoma suspended looping coaster named Mind Eraser, and the brand new Island Kingdom water park. In 1998, the new water park was expanded further with a lazy river, an extra children's play structure, and numerous new water slides. Elevator and SNS Turbo Drop was added to the dry park. If that was wasn't enough, Premier Parks made its most ridiculous purchase to date, acquiring the larger Six Flags chain of parks from Time Warner on April 1st, 1998 for 1.86 billion US dollars. In 1999, the water park saw another substantial expansion, adding a second wave pool and a slide tower. The dry park saw the addition of Blizzard River near Cyclone and the establishment of Crack Axle Canyon, a new western themed area with three new rides. The park's southern end also saw the addition of new flat rides. Despite all the additions, a notable removal took place following the 1999 season. Premier Parks, now under the name of Six Flags, had their prospects set on record growth and removed the iconic Riverside Park Speedway, which had been a fixture since 1948. This decision dealt a devastating blow to New England's racing culture. However, Six Flags knew that modern thrill rides were a better means of raising attendance, and the seven and a quarter acre space taken by the racetrack was perfect for expansion. On December December 8, 1999, Six Flags announced that Riverside Park would reopen in 2000 as Six Flags New England, accompanied by a $40 million investment. Bear in mind that by this point, over $80 million had been invested in Riverside Park since its acquisition in 1996. The year 2000 witnessed the replacement of Black Widow with Flashback, a Vacoma boomerang coaster. Elevator was renamed Scream and received two more drop towers. The former Speedway was replaced with the new 12.5 acre DC Super superhero adventures. The new area introduced two new flat rides, an outdoor amphitheater for a Batman high-tech stunt show, a family coaster called Poison Ivy's Tangled Train, and the park's new star attraction, Superman Ride of Steel. At the time, Superman was considered far too large for the park, but CEO Kieran E. Burke wanted this ride to attract the masses. Superman Ride of Steel was manufactured by Intamin as part of their mega coaster product line.
line. Interestingly, Six Flags had purchased three Intamin Mega Coasters, all named Superman Ride of Steel. The original Superman debuted at Darien Lake in 1999 as Intamin's inaugural Mega Coaster. This new roller coaster, costing $12 million, coincided with the park's transformation into Six Flags Darien Lake that same year. Darien Lake Superman quickly gained immense popularity due to its exhilarating speed, close to the ground moments, smooth ride, and generous amounts of airtime. However, it also had its own issues, which we will discuss later in the video. The other Superman Ride of Steel opened at Six Flags America in 2000, following the park's rebranding to a Six Flags park in 1999. This Superman is an identical mirror image to the one at Darien Lake but was not specifically designed for its terrain like Darien Lakes was. This particular Superman Ride of Steel is the only one among the three that has retained its original name and operated without any incidents. Due to the available land at Six Flags New England being incompatible with the layout of the identical Superman coasters, it received its own unique design resulting in a significantly improved ride experience. While New England Superman shares the same 208-foot lift height as the others, almost everything else was enhanced. It features a larger drop into an underground tunnel, more airtime hills, a greater variety of ride elements, a second underground tunnel later in the ride, and still includes two helices that are more powerful than the helices of the other Superman coasters. I've heard that during the early stages of development, the plan for New England Superman was slightly less ambitious. This was because an inverted boomerang coaster from Vacoma, identical to Invertigo at Kings Island, was originally planned to debut in 2000. However, Six Flags opted to relocate Vampire, an existing Vacoma boomerang coaster from what was Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom to New England significantly reducing costs. Today, the ride goes by the name Flashback. Consequently, more capital was allocated to Superman Ride of Steel, resulting in the version we have today. Over the off-season, construction crews erected the massive steel roller coaster, along with the rest of the new DC Superhero Adventures area. The park's skyline gradually filled with blue supports and red track as the towering steel lattice structure of the lift hill and first camelback rose prominently into the air, along with all of the ride's subsequent elements. A notable feature is the ride's first tunnel, Tunnel, which alone cost $750,000. Much of Superman's elaborate second half, depicted here, occupies the space where the speedway once stood. Even before the coaster was completed, one of the ride's trains is seen placed on the storage track. On the right, you can see the coaster's innovative magnetic brake run. We will revisit these aspects later in the video as they both prove to be problematic. Construction concluded and testing commenced in the spring as Superman Ride of Steel roared to life, hurtling through its 5,400 feet of track. Six Flags New England held its grand opening on May 5th, 2000, alongside Superman Ride of Steel, which quickly became a crowd favorite. The ride was praised for its smoothness, abundant airtime, strong positive g-forces, and impressive duration. The inclusion of underground tunnels added another exciting dimension, and its original open-air trains matched the experience perfectly. They featured a seatbelt and comfortable lap bar restraint, which was referred to as a T-bar due to its T-like shape. The ride could run two trains at a time, with one train being red and the other blue. The ride begins with a lift hill right out of the station. Trains are pulled to the top at a 30 degree angle using a conventional chain lift, but the ascent is quiet thanks to the ride's silent anti-rollback system, which eliminates the clacking sound you'll find on other lift hills. The lift hill runs along the Connecticut River, and riders in the left of the train are provided an excellent view of it, while riders in the right get a great view of the park. After about 50 seconds, the train reaches the top and plunges down a 221 foot drop with a slope of 70 degrees. Riders in the back cars experience incredible airtime as they are propelled into the descent. The train then travels underground, reaching a top speed of 77 miles per hour. In the middle of the pullout, the valley's radius tightens as the train ascends out of the tunnel. Next, riders enter a large camelback standing about 145 feet tall, which delivers several seconds of strong floater airtime to riders in all rows of the train. The airtime sort of abruptly ends with the slightest jolt as the train enters a wide pullout, and that's actually a common theme with how Superman tracks its layout. The transitions aren't as smooth as Intamin's newer coasters, but it's nothing I'd call rough or uncomfortable, just slightly awkward. Part of this jolt is also because the airtime ends earlier than you'd expect. Due to the uphill terrain underneath the camelback, the drop back to ground is noticeably smaller than the ascent. This is further intensified by the ascent starting 13 feet below the already lower ground level at the start of the camelback. But with this drawback, it does technically make Superman a terrain coaster. The train enters a fast 
fast-paced overbank turn which banks beyond 90 degrees. This element delivers a sustained 2.5 Gs and trains exit in the opposite direction they entered. Next is a high-speed, low-to-the-ground section where the track curves left, running parallel to the first camelback. This is followed by a gentle descent that provides a 0G moment of weightlessness. Following is a tight pullout leading into another camelback, offering several seconds of airtime that I find stronger than the first camelback. This leads to another pullout with over 3Gs. The ride's most famous airtime moment ensues as riders encounter a slightly smaller camelback delivering about negative 1.1Gs. Throughout the ride's history, this has consistently been its standout moment and it's easily the best airtime moment on the ride. The track curves slightly to the left in the following pullout and riders ascend roughly 80 feet into Superman's most gentle moment. The track then descends to the right as the coaster enters a 360 degree helix. The positive g-forces gradually increase and peak at the bottom of the drop. The curve continues, ascending up another hill which provides a powerful pop of airtime. A relatively tight 540 degree helix follows, combining positive and lateral g-forces when trains are traveling at sufficient speeds. The helix descends to ground level at its midpoint and then rises back up as it heads into another airtime hill. Riders are lifted out of their seats and then descend into one of the coaster's most photographed moments, a curving drop into the second underground tunnel, subjecting riders to over 3 Gs. The train emerges from the tunnel and rises about 36 feet in the air. Next is another drop, delivering good airtime for riders in the back cars. The train passes through a trim break, but the following two bunny hills still provide strong negative g-forces. The first is approximately 26 feet tall, while the second is about 23 feet tall, with both delivering powerful airtime. Next is a low to the ground turn that leads into the extremely short final brake run, which slows trains from 40 to 0 miles per hour in just the length of the train. As short as the stop is, it's actually quite smooth. Afterwards, the train advances into the station, ending the over two and a half minute experience. During the early 2000s, Superman was an unquestionably world-class coaster. It offered an extensive layout with exceptional positive g-forces, relentless pacing all the way through, plentiful moments of ejector airtime, and a captivating blend of design styles, featuring an out and back beginning and a powerful spaghetti bowl finale. Not to mention, the original open air trains were truly remarkable. They were specifically designed to complement the ride style, featuring a simplistic T-bar restraint system that not only provided utmost comfort, but also greatly enhanced the overall ride experience. In 2000, Superman was honored as the 10th best steel roller coaster in the world by Amusement Today's Golden Ticket Awards, but Park World Magazine named it the number one coaster in the world. The ride's excellence continued to be recognized, securing second place from the Golden Ticket Awards for World's Best Steel Roller Coaster in both 2001 and 2002. However, the pinnacle of its achievements came in 2003, 2006, 2007, 2008, and 2009 when the Golden Ticket Awards crowned it the World's Best Steel Roller Coaster. And this recognition stretched beyond the Golden Ticket Awards or Park World Magazine, as the ride topped the charts in many other coaster polls and earned high rankings among many roller coaster enthusiasts. But as I will highlight later in the video, this is because in many ways, Superman was a different roller coaster in the 2000s compared to what it is today. As a series of changes made to the ride have hindered its once flawless experience, and the ride doesn't win awards like it used to. Intamin have always been known for pushing the boundaries of roller coaster design and embracing risk, and the same tactic was taken when creating Superman Ride of Steel. But unfortunately, these design risks would ultimately lead to the devastating problems the coaster experienced in the 2000s. To help explain this, let me describe how experimental Intamin was in the time period when the three Superman mega coasters debuted. Intamin continuously made tweaks and upgrades to the same coaster model each year. To highlight the company's rapid iteration, we'll compare the three Superman mega coasters to the renowned Millennium Force at Cedar Point, an Intamin Giga roller coaster which also opened in 2000. Millennium Force, which at heart is a larger Intamin mega coaster, is a generation ahead of the three Superman mega coasters in many ways. For instance, while the three Superman coasters utilize a conventional chain lift, Millennium Force introduced Intamin's elevator cable lift system, enabling faster ascent to the top of the lift hill. Intamin's development of the elevator cable lift was primarily driven by the need to accommodate Millennium's towering 310-foot height within the limited available space. Subsequently, Intamin's later mega coasters, such as 2001's Expedition G-Force at Holiday Park and 2002's Goliath at Wallaby Holland, feature cable lifts. 
despite having shorter lift hills than the three Superman mega coasters. Now, it's worth noting that the use of chain lifts in the three Superman mega coasters isn't really much of a drawback. Interestingly, Intimate has since returned to using chain lifts as seen in 2018's Hyperion at Energylandia and 2021's Conda at Wallaby, Belgium. However, other design discrepancies are far more perplexing. One puzzling difference lies in the trains used on Millennium Force, which may appear identical to the original trains used on all three Superman coasters, but actually possess notable distinctions. I must clarify that I am referring to the original fleet of trains that Superman Ride of Steel debuted with, not the newly refurbished trains in operation today. On the three Superman mega coasters and Millennium Force, all trains feature stadium seating, meaning the second row of seats in each car is slightly elevated compared to the first row, which enhances the view for riders in the second row of each car. In Superman's original trains, the two seats of the first row in each car are positioned closer together, while the two seats in the second row are spaced further apart. In the first row, the steel support frame of the seats is connected, whereas in the second row, each seat has a separate support frame. This arrangement likely aimed to further enhance the view for riders in the second row of each car, but it meant that passengers in the front row were more squished. In Millennium Forces trains, the seats in both the first and second rows are evenly spaced, presumably to offer riders more room between each other. Notice that all seats have their own support frames. For many years afterward, Intamin seemed to adopt the seat spacing on Millennium Force. Another major difference is with the setup of the two hydraulic cylinders which lock each lap bar restraint. On all seats of Millennium Force's trains, the two hydraulic cylinders are positioned in a housing between riders' legs, with the central tube of the T-bar rising from the sensor housing. In the original Superman trains, the arrangement is more intricate. In the front row of each car, the hydraulic cylinders are positioned between riders' legs in a small housing, like all rows on Millennium Force. The sensor tube of the T-bar then connects to the centrally placed housing. In the second row of each car, the hydraulic cylinders are not between rider's legs. The cylinders are instead placed outside of rider's legs with one to the left and another to the right. Behind the center of the first row is a housing that accommodates two hydraulic cylinders, one for the left seat and another for the right seat. We'll call these the interior cylinders. On both the left and right side of the first row, there is a black triangular housing that holds one cylinder each for the second row lap bars. These are the outer cylinders. Each lap bar in the second row is connected to its outer and inner cylinders with a steel bar that rests over each rider's feet. From an engineering perspective, having a different design between the first and second row of each car makes the trains more complex to manufacture, build, and maintain, as more components are necessary. Intamin's more consistent approach with Millennium Force's trains is far superior in all regards, whose trains oddly debuted in the same year as two of the Superman mega coasters, which are vastly different. Another notable improvement in Millennium Force is the smoothness of its track transitions. The ride's track profiling is refined, leading to fluid transitions without any sudden jolts or rapid changes in acceleration. Part of this is due to the track being heartlined, meaning it rotates around riders when banking into or out of turns, keeping a rider's center of mass in the same position. This helps prevent being jostled around from side to side. On Superman, its track profiling appears to lack heartlining when banking into or out of turns. As a result, riders feel more like they are tipping to the side as they rotate around the track rather than the track rotating around them. Additionally, there are slight jerks in the transitions of Superman, such as on the first Camelback where the airtime sensation ends more abruptly rather than gradually, or in the first underground tunnel where riders can feel the radius of the valley tightening as the train ascends the first Camelback. These jerks occur when the change in acceleration or g-force happens too abruptly instead of gradually. Such occurrences were common in older roller coasters designed without the aid of computers, similar to many roller coasters built by Aerodynamics. I go much more into detail on this in my videos on Loch Ness Monster and Drakenfire at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. But Superman was designed using computers, so it's surprising that it exhibits slight jerking in its transitions. You'll notice a jolt on the identical Supermans at Six Flags Darien Lake in America as trains descend the second airtime hill. The airtime abruptly ends and leads into a tight pullout. It's most noticeable on the back cars. On Superman at New England, I find that the second helix showcases the most noticeable jerks as the track transitions between different inclines or radiuses. Fortunately, the ride is not rough like older aero coasters, just slightly awkward. But it's intriguing that Millennium Force exhibits much smoother transitions and has heartlining, even though it opened in the same year as Superman the Ride. This may have been another aspect of Intamin's experimentation, as some of their coasters older than Superman the Ride 
Red already featured heartlining. Amongst other differences, there were specific issues with the brake run on New England Superman which set it apart from the identical Superman coasters and Millennium Force. All four coasters utilize magnetic brake runs where metal fins on the sides of each car pass through powerful permanent magnets mounted on brake calipers. As the fins slide between the magnets, the train is slowed down. One fascinating aspect is there is no physical contact between the fins and magnets, significantly prolonging the lifespan of these components. However, due to the absence of physical contact, magnetic brakes alone cannot fully stop a train. They can slow trains to a crawl or bring them to a stop on flat sections of track, but further assistance is required. On all four coasters, trains come into contact with drive tires following the magnetic brakes, which either stops the train completely or propels it forward. On the identical Supermans, the brake runs were constructed on a downward slope. Initially, there were five collapsible brake calipers, allowing the brakes to retract and enable trains to roll freely after slowing to a stop. The brake runs are unusually short, even by industry standards today, only matching the length of the eight car trains. This becomes even more astonishing when considering that the limited brake run is directly behind another train parked in the station. However, this was made possible by the strong stopping force of the permanent magnets which were theoretically fail-proof. The drive tires that fully stop or advance the trains forward are positioned after the brake calipers. If a slow-moving or empty train train slows down before reaching the drive tires, it will creep through the magnetic brakes thanks to the downhill slope of the brake run until it makes contact. At that point, the drive tires bring the train to a halt or propel it forward into the station. When running at higher speeds, the fully loaded train stops with its front cars positioned above the drive tires. On Millennium Force, the final brake run is divided into two sections. The first portion is called trim and consists of fixed brake calipers in the set position. When trains are running fast and fully Fully loaded with riders, the section removes most of a train's speed. Each train then continues with some speed into the waiting brake, where four pairs of collapsible brakes slow down trains further. Once each train is slowed to a gentle roll, the brakes retract, allowing trains to roll into the drive tires at the end of the waiting brake, which either propel it forward into the unload station or bring it to a complete stop. In the case of slower moving or empty trains, the trim section slows them down to a crawl. But since this section is downhill, trains will slowly creep through it and into the waiting brake. The curve into the waiting brake is downhill, but the waiting brake itself is flat. To allow the train to reach the drive tires at the end of the waiting brake, the retractable brakes collapse, allowing the train to roll freely into the drive tires. Then with Superman the Ride at Six Flags New England, Intamin designed its brake run differently. Similar to the identical Superman's, it has an extremely short brake run matching the length of its nine car trains. Initially, it had six pairs of collapsible brake calipers, one more than the identical Superman coasters. And instead of a downhill brake run, Superman the Ride has an entirely flat brake run. This means that a slow moving or empty train that stops short cannot gradually advance into the two drive tires after the brake calipers. To address this, Intamin included an extra drive tire just before the final brake caliper. However, it seems that this was insufficient because by the following year in 2001, an additional drive tire was installed just after the first brake caliper in the brake run. It was likely that this was done to prevent slow moving or empty trains from getting stuck in place if they stopped before reaching the drive tire before the final caliper. With the extra drive tire, a train that stopped short could still be propelled forward after coming to a stop in the brakes. As I mentioned earlier, Intamin's magnetic brake run was considered fail-proof, which is why Intamin took the risk of constructing such short brake runs with the Superman Mega Coasters. In contrast, other manufacturers like BNM, known for playing it safe and not taking much risk, have always built coasters with longer brake runs. BNM include an extra section of brakes between where a train comes to a stop at the end of the ride and where another train might be parked further ahead. It's fair to say that Intamin opted for shorter brake runs to to accommodate more ride elements within the layout. However, on August 6, 2001, Intamin's design choice revealed a devastating vulnerability. At the time, Superman at Six Flags New England was operating with two trains on the track. The red train was speeding through the spaghetti bowl approaching the end of the ride, while the blue train was in the station getting ready to dispatch. The red train entered the final brake run which should have brought it to a complete stop. Shockingly, it failed to do so and only slowed down to just less than 20 miles per hour before colliding with the blue train. The impact of the crash produced a loud bang that could be heard in the surrounding area. Each of Superman's original trains, when fully loaded with riders, could weigh as much as 27,000 pounds. 
So just imagine the force of the impact. The crash was powerful enough to push the blue train out of the station and partially up the lift hill. With four of its nine cars resting on the lift, both trains sustained significant damage. Considering that each train could accommodate up to 36 riders, and if both trains were fully loaded, there could have been up to 72 riders involved in the crash. 22 passengers were taken to local hospitals, all with minor injuries to their necks, backs, and faces. Two or three riders even lost consciousness during the collision. Thankfully, there were no fatalities. Following the collision, a 12-day investigation was conducted by experienced safety experts and engineers to determine the cause of the crash. On August 18, 2001, Six Flags New England issued a statement regarding the investigation and modifications made to the ride. In summary, it was determined that a ruptured air supply line disrupted airflow and air pressure levels in the primary braking system, thereby hindering the full engagement of the backup brakes. Despite this, the brakes still operated at 60% of their capacity, slowing the train to under 20 miles per hour as it entered the station. To prevent another collision, four modifications were implemented. The PVC air supply lines were replaced with steel reinforced ones. Quick release valves were installed to expedite the engagement of the backup brakes. A remote air pressure monitoring system was added to detect air pressure fluctuations more quickly to allow faster engagement of the backup mechanism. Additionally, a separate control valve system was installed for each pair of brake calipers to enhance redundancy. Tim Black, the vice president and general manager of Six Flags New England, stated that the addition of steel reinforced air supply lines alone would have been sufficient to prevent a recurrence but safety experts decided to incorporate the other three safety measures as well. The ride reopened on August 18, 2001, the same day the press release was issued, but only the blue train was available. From what I understand, it consisted of a combination of undamaged cars from both the blue and red trains with the red cars painted blue to match. Among the changes made to the brake run, an undisclosed change was the replacement of the first pair of collapsible brake calipers with a fixed set. So now the brake run had five pairs of collapsible brakes and one pair of fixed brakes. Superman continued operating with only one train until July 3rd, 2002, when the red train finally returned, restoring the ride to its intended two train operations after nearly a year with just one. But why did the collision occur in the first place? How was this possible with what was supposed to be a fail-proof system? Typically, roller coaster brakes engage automatically. This means that even if there is a loss of air pressure or a complete power outage, the brakes will remain engaged and stop a moving coaster train. So the brakes are naturally in something called their set position and require power to release. Therefore, in the case of Superman the Ride, a loss of air pressure should not have affected the braking ability of the magnetic brake system. Instead, it should have only caused issues with releasing the brakes once the train had come to a complete stop and needed to move forward. Continuing with the story of Intamin's rapid design changes, Superman the Ride utilizes a different system that opens and closes its brake calipers compared to the identical Supermans at Darien Lake and Six Flags America. On the identical Superman, small pneumatic cylinders are attached to each brake caliper. These cylinders are double action, meaning compressed air is pumped into either the top or bottom of the cylinder to move a piston rod within the cylinders up or down. The piston rod then controls the motion of the collapsible brake caliper. Therefore, the direction of travel depends on which end of the cylinder receives air pressure. Thus, air pressure is required to set the brake into its braking position, and air pressure is also required to release the brake from the set position. In the event of an issue with the air pressure supply or even complete power loss, the identical supermans have large counterweights attached to each brake caliper. Due to gravity, the counterweights cause the natural position of the brakes to be in the set position. So even in situations where there is a loss of air pressure or a complete power outage, the counterweight ensures that each brake is engaged, making the system failsafe. With Intamin being Intamin, Superman the Ride and Millennium Force use different pneumatic cylinders. They are larger than the double action cylinders on the identical Superman coasters, and the collapsible brake calipers do not have counterweights. Overall, the system is simpler. The pneumatic cylinders are single-action spring-release cylinders. Unlike the double-action cylinders, only one end of the cylinder can accept pressurized air, while the other side contains springs. These cylinders, known as push-type cylinders, operate by pumping pressurized air into one end, which pushes the piston rod down and compresses the springs below it. This action collapses the brake calipers from being engaged. When pressurized air is released from the cylinder, the springs rebound, pushing the piston rod back up, which sets the brakes in the braking 
position. On Millennium Force and Superman the Ride, the brakes will remain disengaged as long as the air pressure in each cylinder is stronger than the compressive strength of the springs. However, if there is a loss of air pressure or electricity, the springs will overpower the air pressure and return the brake to the braking position. Thus, the springs serve as the failsafe mechanism instead of the counterweights used with Intamin's dual-action pneumatic cylinders. For pneumatic systems, a complete power loss can cause a loss of air supply or a significant drop in air pressure. During a power loss, Millennium Force's collapsible brakes remain engaged. In this power loss, it caused a train to stop short in the final brake run, leaving a few cars outside the catwalk. To evacuate all riders, the ride crew had to push the train forward by hand. Note that a considerable number of people were required to push the train against the engaged brakes, whereas when the brakes are not engaged, only two or three crew members would be needed. I've personally pushed a train on El Toro at Great Adventure and can attest to this. But what's important to note is that in a complete power failure, air supply is lost, but the brakes remain engaged because of the springs within the cylinders. Therefore, a loss of air supply at Superman the Ride should have caused the compressed energy of the springs to exceed the diminished air pressure within the cylinders, forcing the piston rod out of the cylinders and engaging the brakes. The springs are most likely what the park referred to as the backup mechanism in their press release. The only explanation I can come up with is that the disrupted airflow on the day of the collision somehow misled the ride's control system into believing the brakes were engaged when they were not. To help explain this, it's critical that you understand what a block zone is. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. At least that is what a block system is supposed to do, but something went haywire on Superman the Ride in 2001. Superman operates with three block zones. The station block zone, the lift hill block zone, and the back brake block zone, which encompasses the entire ride layout. This minimalist design allows for two trains at most to operate on the track. To enable a train to leave the station, the lift block must be clear. Similarly, for a train to move from the lift block to the long back brake block, the back brake block must be clear. And then for a train to advance from the back brake block to the station block, the station must be clear. On the day of the collision, the red train on Superman was allowed to proceed into the back brake block because the blue train was parked in the station and clear of the back brake. But there's another condition that must be met. In order for a train to leave the lift block and enter the back brake block, the brakes on the final brake run must be set, regardless of one or two train operations. So in situations where the back brake block was unoccupied, but the brakes were not set for whatever reason, the control system would stop a train at the top of the lift hill, preventing it from proceeding into the back brake block. When the accident occurred, the brakes were not in their set position, so the red train should not have been permitted to leave the lift hill. But as we all know, that didn't happen. Therefore, the control system had to believe that the brakes were indeed applied. Was this bad programming? How could this be possible? Well, it is highly likely that the disrupted airflow had an impact on another crucial component of the pneumatic cylinders, the solenoid valves, which are highlighted here. Solenoid valves are electronically operated and control the direction of airflow into or out of a pneumatic cylinder. In the case of Superman the Ride, solenoid valves enable the ride control system to automate the movable brakes. Now, I cannot stress enough Enough that this is all my own speculation, but after studying pneumatic systems for days, this is the only sense I can make out of the situation. The solenoid valves used on Superman the Ride are most likely something called normally closed, pilot-operated solenoid valves. Pilot-operated solenoid valves utilize the mainline pressure of pneumatic systems to assist with opening and closing a main valve within the solenoid. By mainline pressure, I mean the same pressurized air that actuates the pneumatic cylinders is also also used to open and close the main valve within the solenoid valve. In a pilot operated solenoid valve, there is a medium within that contains an inlet port and an outlet port. The inlet port is where air from the main line enters the solenoid valve, so the pressurized air from the accumulator tanks. The outlet port is where pressurized air enters the pneumatic cylinders that move the brakes. Separating the inlet and outlet ports is a main valve shown here, and a smaller pilot valve shown here. 
In a normally closed solenoid, which I believe are used on Superman the Ride, the pilot valve is closed when the solenoid shown here is de-energized. Thus, this is the resting state of the solenoid valve. When this happens, the pressure within the inlet port becomes higher than the pressure within the outlet port. This forces the main valve to shut closed, preventing more air from entering the outlet port and into the pneumatic cylinder. Additionally, there is also an exhaust port outside the valve that allows pressurized air within the cylinder to escape, allowing the springs within the cylinder to decompress and push the brake back into its set position. When the solenoid is energized, it opens the small pilot valve within the medium. This allows some air from the inlet port to begin entering the outlet port. This causes air pressure in the outlet port to exceed that of the inlet port, forcing the main valve open, allowing for a full flow of pressurized air from the supply line to enter the pneumatic cylinders. The pressurized air fills the top of the cylinders, compressing the springs below, which retracts all brakes from the braking position. Thus, pilot-operated solenoid valves depend on a slight pressure differentiation between the inlet and outlet ports in order to open and close the main valve, which is why the system relies on a continuous feed of air pressure from the main air supply line, even when the solenoids are de-energized, meaning the brakes are set in the braking position. For the ride control system to open or close the brakes, that action is as simple as energizing or de-energizing the solenoid valves. When electricity is sent to the solenoid valves to energize them, this leads to the brakes releasing. And when electricity is cut from the solenoid valves to de-energize them, the brakes will set into the braking position. By default, the solenoids cause the brakes to set since they require power to release the brakes. In the park's press release, they stated that disrupted airflow and air pressure levels in the primary braking system System, hindered the full engagement of the backup brakes. As I mentioned earlier, by backup brakes, I believe that is the springs within each cylinder. When Superman collided, the air supply line to all the brakes ruptured, lowering the amount of air pressure being supplied to each solenoid valve and connected pneumatic cylinder. I would assume this rupture occurred while the solenoid valves were energized, meaning the pilot and main valves were both open, which released the brakes and allowed Blue Train to roll off the brake run into the station. Once the airline ruptured, it meant significantly less air was flowing into the inlet port of the solenoid valves. When the control system went to de-energize the solenoid valves, which would set the brakes into the default braking position, there wasn't enough air pressure in the inlet port to overpower the air pressure of the outlet port, which would unfortunately leave the main valve slightly open, allowing a diminished amount of pressurized air to still flow into the pneumatic cylinders. This can be an issue with pilot-operated solenoid valves, as air will continue to act against the springs of the pneumatic cylinders cylinders, meaning the brakes would be pulled slightly from the default braking position and be less effective. In order to avoid this, it is necessary to cut airflow altogether from the accumulator tanks, as this would cause air supply to diminish entirely and let the springs set the brakes in the braking position. So why wasn't air pressure cut entirely once the supply lines ruptured? Well, according to the press release, only the accumulator tanks that supply pressurized air to all of the brakes were pressure monitored by the ride control system. Like many pneumatic systems, the actual supply lines that feed pressurized air from the accumulator tanks to the brakes were not pressure monitored. So when the air supply line ruptured, the ride's control system had no idea since the accumulator tanks still reported normal pressure. And since the control system had already de-energized the solenoid valves, it must have assumed that the brakes were set, since the air pressure in the accumulator tanks was still okay. Thus, the brakes in the back brake block were considered set by the computer even though they weren't, allowing the red train climbing the lift to enter the back brake block. This is why one of the fixes to Superman's brake run was replacing the original PVC, or plastic air supply lines, with steel supply lines that would be harder to rupture. Quick release valves were also added, most likely to aid the exhaust system of each pneumatic cylinder to allow air to escape the cylinders faster when the solenoid valves are de-energized, which would allow the brakes to re-engage more quickly. The pressure monitoring system of the entire pneumatic system was also enhanced, which would help to identify a pressure loss like on the day of the accident in the supply lines. I'd imagine that once a pressure loss was detected, air pressure would immediately stop being supplied from the accumulator tanks, which would cause the brakes to set no matter what. Had the control system known to stop supplying air pressure on the day of the 
the collision, I'd imagine the brakes would have automatically fully engaged. And the last fix was to install a separate control valve system for each set of brakes, increasing the redundancy of the system. With these fixes, it is now completely impossible for the same collision to happen again. So even with the ride's comically short brake run, fear not, as every train will come to a safe and smooth stop no matter the circumstances. In fact, Superman's brake run is actually slightly longer than it used to be. The brake run originally consisted of six pairs of brakes, but that wasn't always adequate as Superman would occasionally overshoot its final brake run. This did not mean a collision took place, but that trains would stop beyond a maximum allowable point. This would trigger a fault in the ride's control system, forcing the ride to shut down. I've heard that overshoots were common occurrences on hot summer days when the ride ran its fastest. Oftentimes, the park would not allow riders to board the middle car of both trains to reduce each train's weight and speed to help limit overshoots. As a more permanent fix, the park added a seventh brake caliper to the brake run for the 2004 season. In this picture from 2005, it's the blue brake caliper positioned before the original brakes. It's also closer to its neighboring brake caliper than the rest. As I mentioned earlier, a fixed pair of brakes replaced the first pair of retractable brakes following the 2001 crash. While also in 2004, the permanent set of brakes were swapped back to a retractable brake, bringing the count to 14 collapsible brakes. But with the change, this increased the stopping power of the short brake run, which greatly reduced the chances of overshoots. And this is how the brake run still functions today, bringing the ride slightly heavier trains to a safe and smooth stop every cycle. I hear that overshoots still occasionally happen, but I believe they are more rare. In subsequent mega coasters built by Intamin, they continue to experiment and enhance their brake runs. In 2001's Expedition G-Force at Holiday Park, the final brake run is much longer than the ride's seven car trains. It consists of seven pairs of brake calipers, with the first three being fixed and the last four being collapsible. When trains are fully loaded and running at speed, they pass through the fixed brakes and slow to a crawl within the collapsible brakes. The brakes then retract and four drive tires propel the train forward into the station. 2002's Goliath at Wallaby Holland is weird and only has fixed brakes on its brake run. After a train slows to a stop, a large number of drive tires raise into position and push the train forward through the engaged brakes, which requires a lot of power. In later years, Intamin began implementing brake runs with multiple sections, like in 2003's Balder at Lisiburg, where a trim section removes most of each train's speed, allowing trains to enter the next section of brake run at a controlled rate. But even though Intamin no longer build brake runs like they did on Superman Ride of Steel, the issues with its brake run were 100% resolved, making it truly failsafe. But despite this, the ride still had unresolved safety concerns. From its inception, Superman gained popularity for its powerful airtime. This made it a favorite among roller coaster enthusiasts and earned it numerous awards. To ensure rider safety, each passenger was secured with both a seatbelt and a lap bar referred to as a T-bar. The lap bar, which was equipped with two hydraulic cylinders for redundancy, required electricity to unlock and could only be released in the station. Tragically, on Saturday, May 1st, 2004, at about 3 p.m., a fatal accident occurred on Superman Ride of Steel at Six Flags New England. Stanley J. Morbarski, a 55-year-old man, fell from the coaster just before it reached the final curve into the brake run, leading to his untimely death. The ride was immediately shut down and an investigation ensued. It was determined that the T-bar restraint had not failed and remained securely locked in place. The seatbelt too was still fastened. The issue was that due to the victim's unique body dimensions, the T-bar did not adequately secure him. To be restrained properly, Properly, the T-bar needs to contact a rider's upper thighs, but in the victim's case, it only contacted his stomach. Stanley Morbarski was roughly 5 feet 3 inches tall, weighed 225 pounds, and had cerebral palsy, which causes issues with movement, balance, and posture. In 2003, Morbarski attempted to ride Superman but was denied by the ride crew because it wasn't safe for him. But on that fateful day in 2004, the ride crew did accommodate Morbarski. Normally, Morbarski wouldn't have been able to secure the seat belt which would have indicated he couldn't ride. But the ride attendant sat Morbarski in the first row of a car where seatbelts were 11 inches longer. Curiously, every car on Superman's trains had seatbelts that were 11 inches longer in the first row than those in the second row due to their mounting positions. These seatbelts had been installed by the ride's manufacturer, Intamin. The existence of these seatbelts was a direct result of a previous incident on Superman Ride of Steel at Darien Lake. On May 16, 1999, just a day after its grand 
grand opening, a rider was ejected from the coaster as a train decelerated on the final brake run. Similar to the incident in New England, the ejected rider was not adequately secured by the T-bar restraint due to their size. The victim, Michael DeWalby, weighed around 400 pounds, and the lap bar only contacted his stomach instead of his upper thighs. At that time, Intamin had not installed seatbelts on Superman Ride of Steel, and the ride crew was responsible for ensuring that the lap bar properly contacted each rider's upper thighs. Like the New England Superman, Darien Lake Superman also features significant airtime. As the train traversed the final bunny hill, DeWalby was left standing due to the airtime. When the brake run abruptly stopped the train, DeWalby was unable to hold on and fell. Fortunately, the train was close to the ground and had greatly reduced speed, leading to DeWalby surviving the fall. However, he sustained serious injuries that would affect him for the rest of his life. Following this incident, DeWalby received a settlement of $2.85 million from Six Flags, and Intamin subsequently installed seatbelts on the coaster. These seatbelts were not meant to serve as secondary restraints, but rather as a measuring device to assist ride operators in determining if passengers were safely secured by the lap bar. If a rider could not fasten the seatbelt due to their body dimensions, they would not be allowed to ride. Consequently, the two Superman coasters at Six Flags New England and Six Flags America opened in 2000 thousand with pre-installed seatbelts, but Intamin's negligence allowed for seatbelts in the first row of every car to be 11 inches longer than those in the second row. When Morbarski fell from Superman Ride of Steel in 2004, it was clear that the longer seatbelts were not adequate at measuring passengers. Additionally, the Superman Ride crew should have known better than to permit Morbarski to ride, as the lap bar only contacted his stomach and not his upper thighs. Meanwhile, I don't think this was a problem on Millennium Force at Cedar Point and all of its seatbelts were the same length from day one, which again is a substantial upgrade over the Superman Mega Coasters, even though it opened in the same year. In fact, there were several other accidents involving Intamin's T-bar restraints in that era. There was of course the 1999 accident on Superman Ride of Steel at Six Flags Darien Lake. Another took place in 2001 when a woman fell from the now-defunct Perilous Plunge at Knott's Berry Farm. And just a few weeks before the 2004 accident at Six Flags New England, a 16 year old girl fell from Hydro at Oakland Theme Park. Each one of these accidents occurred due to the same reason. Each victim was not properly secured by the T-bar restraint. Following the investigation, the Massachusetts Department of Public Safety banned the use of T-bar restraints, but I believe this applied to either Superman Ride of Steel specifically or Intamin's T-bar restraint. As Six Flags New England opened Pandemonium in 2005 with T-bar restraints, but the ride was produced by Gerslauer, another ride manufacturer. To to reopen Superman, Massachusetts required that Six Flags New England either replace the T-bar restraints or modify them with a state-approved fix designed by the manufacturer. Six Flags chose to modify the restraint system and implemented the same modifications to the other two Superman Ride of Steels. This was the catalyst that led to Superman's demise in popularity amongst coaster enthusiasts. Thin steel bars were added to the outsides of all lap bars to ensure all legs remained within the T-bar. Shin cups were mounted to the center pole of the lap bar to ensure all riders' legs remained in an upright position, which improved leg contact with the lap bar. The yellow portion of the lap bar, called the modesty bar, was slightly lengthened, and the original black seatbelts were replaced with orange seatbelts that were all of the same length. They resembled seatbelts found on airplanes, featuring a 180 degree release mechanism. The ride's maximum height limit was reduced from 78 inches to 76 inches, the idea being that if a rider's legs were too long, that might cause the lap bar to close on a rider in a way that didn't properly secure them. To ensure every lap bar was closed to a minimum position that was considered safe for the largest possible rider, a new seatbelt was added as part of a new go or no go system. The seatbelt was connected to the grab bar of each T-bar and had to latch to a buckle on the side of each seat. If a rider wasn't able to secure that go or no go belt, it meant their restraint was too high and they weren't able to ride. The Massachusetts Department of Public Safety approved the modifications and Superman Ride of Steel reopened on May 29, 2004, and continued to safely operate with its modified restraints until the end of 2008. In 2005, Superman's Go or No Go belt would be replaced with an interlock between the T-bar restraints and control system, which you might know as a Verify. This is common on most roller coasters built today, such as on any coaster built by Rocky Mountain Construction. With an interlock, sensors 
sensors are placed within each lap bar and alert the control system if they are closed to a minimum position. If just one of the train's lap bars is not closed to this minimum position, the control system will not allow the train to dispatch out the station. Intamin started using this verification system on nearly all their subsequent roller coasters, such as on El Toro at Great Adventure, which opened in 2006. In many ways, I believe Superman was ahead of its time by featuring strong airtime without a verify interlocking the lap bars and control system. But it wasn't the only Intamin roller coaster to do so. Other coasters like Millennium Force at Cedar Point, Expedition G-Force at Holiday Park, and Balder at Liseberg feature Intamin's T-Bar, and combine strong airtime without a verify system. Yet all of these coasters have operated without incident since their openings in the early 2000s, as far as keeping riders safely within their restraints. The major difference in these coasters is that Intamin correctly installed seatbelts that were all of the same length, and the ride crews operating these coasters have never been negligent and make sure all riders are safely secured. My point being that Superman Ride of Steel didn't have to be dangerous, and it could have been very safe just like Intamin's other coasters from that time period. But Intamin made it so by oddly installing seatbelts of different lengths, and the Superman ride crew should not have allowed Morbarski to ride since the lap bar only contacted his stomach. Otherwise, his life would have been saved. Without question, this negligence was the spark behind all the ride's modifications over the years that have led to its diminished experience that we know today as Superman the Ride. Superman would continue operating with its modified lap bars under the name Superman Ride of Steel. Even though its awkward restraints were less comfortable, the ride continued to offer the fantastic experience it was known for and win award after award, sweeping the number one steel roller coaster position from the Golden Ticket Awards in 2006, 2007, and 2008. I never rode the coaster in this configuration, but I have experienced these peculiar restraints on Superman at Six Flags America, which is the only Superman ride of steel to still use them. They're certainly not the most comfortable as I hate the outside bars that wrap your legs and the shin cuffs are awful, but the trains still track the circuit well and the experience for the most part seems unaffected. On May 24th, 2008, Six Flags Magic Mountain reopened X, their aerodynamics fourth dimension roller coaster, as X2. The transformation included a more sleek color scheme, the addition of flamethrowers mid-ride, and most notably, new ride vehicles from S&S. These upgraded trains were significantly lighter and more reliable, boasting an innovative onboard audio system that played music and sound effects during the ride. The overall result was a resounding success allowing the park to effectively market X2 as a new attraction without the need to build a completely new ride, which attracted larger crowds and enhanced the ride's reliability. Encouraged by X2's success and the company's absurd debt, which was in a large part due to the very spending that created Superman Ride of Steel, Six Flags adopted a similar strategy for some of their other roller coasters, with the idea being to breathe new life into existing rides to enhance the experience of that attraction, while also allowing Six Flags to market the transformed experience as a brand new ride without building an actual new one. In September of 2008, Six Flags New England announced the transformation of Superman Ride of Steel into Bizarro, which aimed to enhance the theming and overall experience of the world's best steel roller coaster. Like X2, Bizarro would reopen with newly renovated ride vehicles to improve the overall ride experience. Similarly, Six Flags Great Adventure transformed their B&M floorless roller coaster, Medusa, into Bizarro, though without any major major changes to its trains. Over the off-season, Superman was repainted with purple track and blue supports to match the character of Bizarro. The transformed coaster opened on May 22, 2009 with a full fleet of upgrades. The station building received a splash of new color and Bizarro signage. The queue received storyboards allowing guests waiting in line to read the coaster's new backstory, which definitely came in handy as a large majority of people had never heard of Bizarro before. Various thematic elements were added along the ride experience, like diving into a hole in the earth punched out by Bizarro, racing past building cutouts, whizzing through Superman-shaped S-shields with mist, and even two flamethrowers in the ride's first helix. The renovated purple ride vehicles were equipped with onboard audio, playing a mix of sound effects, movie clips, and songs, including the infamous Bizarro song on the break run. <sighs> Bizarro, 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 Bizarro. 
Overall, the enhancements were well received and provided a more cohesive theme for the ride. But Six Flags' intention to create an experience akin to upscale Disney or Universal parks fell short. Nevertheless, Bizarro earned the title of the world's best steel roller coaster in 2009 by the Golden Ticket Awards. Despite this initial success, the ride's popularity has considerably declined over the years, evident in various coaster polls and among the preferences of roller coaster enthusiasts. Even under its current name, Superman the Ride, many enthusiasts express dissatisfaction with the current state of the coaster. Let's take a step back. After the original T-bars on Superman Ride of Steel were essentially Frankenstein, it seems Six Flags New England aimed to improve the restraint design. This was most likely a costly undertaking, and Six Flags may have decided to retheme the attraction as part of a package deal alongside the improved trains to better market the ride. Keep in mind that Six Flags possessed a substantial debt of over $2 billion at the time, so they needed a good return on any investment they made. And with Medusa at Six Six Flags Great Adventure desperately needing a paint job and not being as popular as it should have due to its poor placement, it appears Six Flags adopted the same bizarro transformation planned for Superman to Medusa as well. To remodel Superman's trains, it seems the park stripped the original trains of their car bodies, restraints, and seats, leaving only the steel chassis below. They then reconfigured the chassis to ensure equal spacing between seats in all rows, similar to Millennium Force, and added newer car bodies resembling the those used in Intamin's latest mega coaster trains at the time. These are less rounded like the original bodies and more box-like in shape, similar to the trains on Intamin's mega light coasters. Large headrests with speakers for the new onboard audio system provided by Show Systems integrators were installed in every seat. Most notably, the park replaced the Frankenstein T-bar restraints with U-bar restraints, as depicted in a teaser picture prior to the ride's reopening. Compared to the T-bars, the U-bars lacked shin cuffs and a central shaft, featuring only outside bars spaced further apart than the exterior steel bars of the Frankenstein T-Bar. The Modesty Bar, the part of the restraint that contacts riders' legs, had a similar size to the Modesty Bars on El Toro at Six Flags Great Adventure, which I consider a great restraint. These new U-Bars generated considerable excitement among park fans, who were eager that the coaster would be better than ever. However, Bizarro did not feature these U-Bars upon reopening. Instead, the Modesty Bars were significantly larger earning them the nickname U-Bricks, which is still commonly used today. The U-Bricks did not contact riders' legs in the same way as the U-Bars on El Toro, creating an awkward and less comfortable experience. The extension of the Modesty Bar downward caused earlier contact with riders' legs, more so at the mid-thigh, unlike the intended contact with the upper thighs. To add to that, the curvature and fit of the Modesty Bars doesn't seem right. With the U-Bricks securely in place, it feels like your legs are being pinned rather than comfortably restrained. This design flaw further affected the ride's comfort, as only a small portion of the oversized restraint adequately contacted each rider's legs. Consequently, all the pressure from the lap bar is concentrated in a smaller area on riders' legs, creating a tighter sensation, even though the restraint itself is not held tighter to your body compared to the T-bars. This discomfort can be most noticeable during the ride's strong airtime moments, which many now find painful. Why would the park suddenly downgrade the ride's new restraints? From what I understand, it appears that the Massachusetts Department of Public Safety rejected the original U-Bars and enforced the use of U-Bricks to prevent the lap bar from contacting a rider's stomach before their legs. In response to Stanley Morbarski's unfortunate death in 2004, the downward extension of the Modesty Bar satisfies this by causing earlier contact with a rider's legs, but it does make them particularly uncomfortable for taller riders. Ironically, this change was unnecessary because Bizarro's trains feature seatbelts that properly determined whether each rider fit within the U-bar restraint, and an interlock system between the restraints and control system ensured that all lap bars were sufficiently lowered for the largest possible riders. This system was identical to the one employed on El Toro, which has U-bars nearly identical to what Bizarro was meant to have. Even with its strong airtime, El Toro has operated without incident, well, in terms of safely securing riders in its trains. Instead, the U-bricks made Bizarro uncomfortable even when the goal of the transfer transformation was to improve comfort, 
And while the U-brick was intended to enhance safety, it actually appeared to have a negative impact in this regard. Lap bar restraints are safest when they contact riders' upper thighs. However, with the U-bricks, the contact point was lower, contacting riders' mid-thighs instead. Theoretically, this lower contact point allowed riders greater freedom of movement in their seats, and positioned the center of mass of their upper bodies further from the lap bar. Thankfully, this was not a safety concern on Bizarro. However, the placement of the restraint sidebars in relation to each rider's legs did pose an issue. When the U-brick was implemented, it raised the position at which the sidebars would rest against riders' legs. Consequently, some riders were able to slip their knees under the sidebars, creating a highly dangerous situation where the knee became trapped under the sidebar. The ride's positive g-forces would push the lap bar down during the layout, potentially causing severe injuries to the rider's knee or worse. To address this, leg guards were added to both sides of all U-bars in 2012. While the leg guards themselves are not bothersome, the steel rings holding them to the U-bars are definitely far from ideal. On El Toro, I can comfortably press my legs against the sidebars of the U-bar without any discomfort. But on Bizarro, or Superman the Ride as it goes today, it's best to keep your legs closer together to avoid contact with the uncomfortable steel rings. Furthermore, the U-bars themselves were somewhat of a makeshift solution, as the train's design was intended for T-bars. Each row features a center housing for two hydraulic cylinders that lock each restraint. On any other Intamin coaster with this setup, there is an opening in the center of the housing for the extension of a T-bar. However, on the renovated train, steel bars protrude sideways from the center of the center housing on both sides above rider's feet. The steel bars are then secured on their outsides to the steel chassis of the train. Consequently, rider's feet sit below the steel bars and between the center housing and outer supports of the lap bar, limiting foot and leg room. On El Toro, the hydraulic cylinders are integrated into the car bodies and rest over each end of the U-bar, allowing for more space between the restraint for riders' legs and feet. Overall, the transformation to Bizarro saw a transition from a Frankenstein T-bar to a Frankenstein U-bar. In addition to the uncomfortable restraints, the newly renovated trains do not track the circuit as smoothly as the originals did. The renovated trains are heavier than the originals, particularly top-heavy when equipped with onboard audio during Bizarro's time. As I mentioned earlier, Superman's track profiling was less refined compared to newer Intamin coasters or even Millennium Force, which opened in the same year. Consequently, the heavier trains accentuated the slight jolts in the ride's transitions, especially in the second helix of the spaghetti bowl. It feels as if the train is jerking from side to side as it moves between different inclines and radii. Personally, I do not view this as a downgrade, but I never rode the original trains. To me, these awkward jolts add character and lateral forces to the ride. However, I must note that I am someone who appreciates the jank of roller coasters built by aerodynamics, which some may disagree with. The onboard audio that helped make the ride rougher was also not the most consistent and could suffer lots of downtime. Often, you'd find one train without any working audio at all. To make the audio function, a row of seats on both trains was removed to make room for a control box, which housed the equipment and control system for the audio system. In both trains, the 10th row of seats was replaced with this control box, smack in the middle of the train, which was a great placement compared to Bizarro at Six Flags Great Adventure, whose audio box was placed in the last row, eliminating two seats in a popular place to sit. But either way, it reduced each train's carrying capacity from 36 to 34 riders. Originally, Superman Ride of Steel could operate at a rate of roughly 1,150 riders per hour most likely 1,152 riders to be exact. This means 32 trains at most could be dispatched an hour at a rate of every 112 and a half seconds. But with 34 passenger trains, this drops the theoretical throughput to 1,088 riders per hour. Now this isn't really a big deal, and thankfully the park operates Superman very well today. It's also been said that the new trains do not run as fast as the originals, at least consistently. I believe with its original trains, Superman Ride of Steel was quite reliable when it came to running ferociously fast. But in this POV comparison between Superman Ride of Steel and Bizarro, they both take the same amount of time to complete the circuit, about 68 seconds from dropping off the lift hill to hitting the final brake run. So this would suggest the new trains are capable at running at the same 
speed. Well, maybe not. I've seen many other POVs of Superman Ride of Steel where the train took only 65 to 66 seconds to complete the ride course, and I haven't really seen the same with Bizarro or Superman the Ride as it goes by today. But who knows, that still could occur with the newly renovated trains. On September 3rd, 2015, Six Flags made an announcement that they would be transforming Bizarro into Superman the Ride for the 2016 season. After the 2015 season concluded, the park began repainting the ride's track back to red and gave the supports a fresh coat of blue paint. Many theming elements from the Bizarro transformation were retained, but most were modified to better suit the Superman theme. The onboard audio system, which had proven to be unreliable, was removed, and speakers were added to the lift hill, playing the classic Superman theme song as the trains ascended into the air as well as on the final brake run. The ride reopened on April 9th, 2016 as Superman the Ride, utilizing the same renovated trains from the Bizarro transformation. However, there were some changes, such as the reintroduction of a blue and red train and the replacement of the onboard audio system with smaller headrests. These headrests, still in use today, were not present during the original Superman Ride of Steel configuration, and their addition was unnecessary if you ask me. Now, I also don't find them bothersome, but removing them would provide a better view for all riders, as well as make the trains a little more aerodynamic. I had the opportunity to ride Superman the Ride in April of 2016, and I personally appreciated the retheme back to Superman from an aesthetic point. In my opinion, the Bizarro transformation was cheesy. The ride's performance, though, remained largely unchanged, with the trains continuing to track somewhat poorly and the Ubrick still not measuring up to the original T-bars. Interestingly, the 10th row of seats on both trains did not make a return, even though the onboard audio system had been removed. Consequently, the coaster still operates without a 10th row of seats to this day. Apparently, this is because during the Bizarro remodel, the 10th row of both trains wasn't reconfigured like the rest of the rows to accept the new seating and restraint format. To add the 10th row of seats back, the park would have to spend a considerable amount to have that work done, or buy two brand new cars from Intamin. If you ask me, this was oversight not having that work done during the Bizarro remodel, as the park should have accounted for not always running the ride with an onboard audio system. Superman's bad luck streak would continue. Just when you thought an improvement was made to the ride, there was another drawback in the horizon. On March 3rd, 2016, Six Flags New England announced that through a partnership with Samsung, Superman and the ride would be among nine Six Flags roller coasters to be enhanced with virtual reality, or VR. Superman the Ride would make its grand debut with virtual reality on June 11th, 2016. With VR headsets, riders journeyed along Superman as he fought Lex Luthor and his Lexbots to save the city. The VR story was programmed to follow the ride's layout and movement, creating an immersive illusion. In this time period, adding VR to rides was all the rage. And today, almost no coasters still utilize VR. Why is that? Well, let me show show you just how big of a logistical nightmare it was to operate Superman with VR. Upon the introduction of VR, Superman the Ride saw a ridiculous drop in rider capacity. Prior to the introduction of VR, the Superman ride crew was trained to dispatch trains as the one on the course was exiting the second tunnel, which is the ride's minimum interval. This meant a train leaving the station would be fully on the lift by the time a train returning to the station stopped on the brake run. Thus, the attraction would commonly accommodate an average of 1,000 riders per hour and the ride commonly operates like this today. But with VR, it became impossible to keep the ride's capacity that high. Dispatches fell from about every two minutes to anywhere from five to eight minutes. This led to an average hourly throughput of only 300 riders, and that's with two trains on the track. This was because in addition to performing the typical unload and load process of new riders, all VR headsets had to be collected from exiting riders. Then boarding riders had to go through the normal procedure of securing their loose articles, fastening their seatbelts and lowering their lap bars. They would then have to fully secure their VR headsets and calibrate them using the QR code on the headrest in front of them. Ride attendants would then have to check restraints like normal, and additional ride attendants would ensure that all VR headsets were properly secure so that they didn't fly off and injure anyone, as well as make sure all headsets were both functioning and calibrated correctly. If any headset wasn't working properly, it had to be swapped for another one, which was a common occurrence and added time to each load cycle. On June 11th, the wait time reached an estimated
estimated five and a half hours. Due to the ultra low capacity and high demand, the queue wouldn't be exhausted of waiting guests until 12.30 a.m., hours past the park's scheduled closing time. Through practice, the ride crew began operating at three to four minute dispatches, but as the summer heat arrived, it began causing issues with the headsets. Powering the headsets were Samsung smartphones, and I'm sure you all know what happens when you leave your smartphone in the heat for too long. They overheat and cannot be used. Well, that's exactly what happened with Superman's VR headsets. While riders were sitting stacked on the uncovered final brake run, the phones would bake in the sun. This would influence the phones to overheat more easily, and oftentimes, riders boarding the next train would need to have their headsets swapped because the phone overheated. This caused major delays, which slowed dispatches back down to a snail's pace. Thus, the ride still had a long line even at the end of each operating day, but the park could only fully staff the ride until 11 p.m. due to child labor laws. To alleviate this, the park began operating Superman without VR for the park's last hour of operations, as well as in the first hour of each day. Even with the long line, this guaranteed that all guests would have ridden the coaster no later than 45 minutes past park closing time, which was before 11 p.m. Speaking of staffing, operating Superman with VR required an enormous number of positions. There was one attendant at the ride's entrance and lockers, two attendants who checked restraints and safety vests, and one operator at main controls. Then there were four attendants who checked VR headsets on the train, one attendant at the ride's exit who filled out disability passes, another attendant at the exit who distributed headsets to riders boarding from the exit, two technicians who troubleshooted any issues with the headsets, four builders who took phones in and out of the headsets, four cleaners who cleaned and sanitized the phones and headsets, three attendants who managed the charging of all phones in the air-conditioned cabinets, four groupers who assigned riders a row to sit as well as helped riders with their VR headsets prior to board, two attendants known as swappers who passed replacement headsets to guests boarding the ride if their headsets stopped working, and one roaming lead who monitored the entire operation. The lead was also responsible for an hourly count of all phones and headsets to ensure nothing was missing. So a total of 30 positions. Without VR, the ride operated with a maximum of six positions, one attendant at the ride's lockers and entrance, four attendants checking restraints, and one operator at controls. With VR, sometimes even 30 positions weren't enough. The hotter it was, the more often phones would overheat and need to be swapped. The park would compensate by adding more cleaners and swappers, bringing the total count anywhere from 34 to 40 positions. Overall, it was the same number of employees who might operate a Universal or Disney attraction, and those are companies who can afford that level of staffing. For a regional Six Flags park, it it was incredibly unsustainable to staff a ride to that magnitude, as not only was it expensive, but finding that many employees while still keeping the park's other rides staffed was a hurdle. As the summer progressed, the park began employing new tricks to improve the VR experience and guest satisfaction. The park began offering VR in only cars 2 through 8 of both trains, as cars 1 and 9 were typically still in the sun even when in the station, causing phones to overheat. With less riders using VR and with less phones overheating, this sped up the loading process immensely. It also meant that guests who just wanted to ride regular Superman could do so. Shortly afterwards, one of the ride's trains began having issues utilizing VR altogether. In a quick decision, the park began using one train for VR and the other for regular Superman. This ended up having a great payoff and the park continued to operate Superman like this through the remainder of the season. With less riders using VR headsets, it greatly reduced the number of phones that overheated, leading to less swaps and an overall faster loading process for each VR train. And with the second train being operated normally, it led to faster dispatch times and a higher hourly capacity of about 600 riders. This meant the separate VR and regular lines moved faster, which helped improve guest satisfaction immensely. In 2017, the park took the lessons they learned with Superman and applied them to Mind Eraser when it operated with VR. This led to a great VR experience from day one. Even so, Six Flags New England would stop utilizing VR on any of their attractions following the 2017 season, as did most parks who had adopted VR on their attractions. It was definitely a gimmick and unsustainable. Overall, I find it so ironic that in the park's attempt to rid Superman of its cheesy bizarro theming and improve the experience, there was yet another hindrance that hurt the ride instead. 
Ever since 2017, Superman the Ride has operated without much drama or incident, and some of the ride's other issues over the years have been handled. Upon opening in 2000, Superman would engage its lift at a slower speed and then accelerate to its full ascent speed once cars 3 and 6 were both engaged on the chain lift. Fun fact, sit in car 3 of the train and you can feel it disengaging from the lift chain at the top. There are often issues where the train on the brake run would not advance forward, usually because the brakes would not release or because the train had stopped in a position where the tire drives didn't grab it. This meant the train climbing the lift would have to be lift stopped, but because it accelerated to high speed so low on the lift hill, it would be higher in the air when stopped, making evacuations more challenging. So in 2013, the ride was reprogrammed to delay when trains accelerated to full speed while climbing the lift. This means that if there is an issue with advancing the next train forward, the train on the lift will be closer to the ground, making an evacuation much easier. Subsequently, I believe this does technically lower the ride's capacity, as it now takes trains over a minute to reach the top of the lift hill compared to the previous 50 seconds. But thankfully, the ride can still operate at over 1,000 thousand riders per hour. The only major downside is that even while operating with just one train on the track, the lift hill still operates with this longer cycle, even though there is not a second train on the brake run that could get stuck. Speaking of the lift hill, this is a rare issue, but very occasionally, Superman can actually roll back while engaging the chain lift. Tire drives in the station push the train out of the station and partially up the lift until car 3 engages the lift chain. On very rainy days where the drive tires are soaked, this can cause the train to actually slip on the drive tire and roll back into the station before the train engages the lift chain. Fear not as this doesn't lead to a collision with the train stopped behind the station as the drive tires in the station will stop the train. It also happens so rarely that it's basically guaranteed you'll never even witness it, let alone be aboard the ride when it happens. Another issue is not with the ride itself, but its location. Superman is primarily located at a low terrain level right alongside the Connecticut River. This subjects the ride to flooding and after heavy amounts of rain can force the ride to close. Typically, the stationary and brake run are most affected. In early July of 2023, I attempted to go to New England and ride Superman, but the ride was closed because of flooding from the Connecticut River. Even during the Speedway days, flooding also appears to have been an issue. Beyond that, the ride has also seen slight programming changes over the years, which many might view as a downgrade, but to most it doesn't matter. For instance, it takes longer for trains to park in the station nowadays than it did when the ride first opened. Notice how in 2001, the train parks in position without really Really slowing to a crawl beforehand, and now the train slows to a crawl well before stopping. Like many parks have done with their coasters, this was probably altered to avoid the possibility of trains parking out of position in the station, which can lead to downtime. The air gates also opened and closed much faster in the early 2000s compared to the comically slow speeds they operate at today. Overall, programming changes like this make it harder to operate the coaster at higher rider throughputs but can help with reliability. Overall, I think the biggest issue the ride suffers from is not getting the recognition it deserves. Ever since the new trains and restraints were introduced in 2009, a majority of coaster enthusiasts from around the world seem to have disdain for Superman the Ride, and the coaster's lack of awards since 2009 2009 make it obvious. Do I think Superman is a bad ride? To be honest, for a while, I felt very jaded about it. I rode Bizarro and then Superman throughout the years of 2014 to 2019, and felt angry that the coaster had been ruined with its awful restraints and heavier trains. But after riding the coaster in July of 2023 on a hot summer day, I have a completely different opinion. In my eyes, Superman is a nearly perfect roller coaster. Its layout is probably one of my absolute favorites. The airtime hills deliver plentiful moments of strong floater and ejector airtime. The ride's valleys and helices are filled with strong positive g-forces. The lack of heartlining in the ride's banking actually leads to lateral forces in some areas, and the ride has an incredible duration of about 70 seconds from first drop to break run without any dead spots. I also adore the ride's fourth hill, which is easily one of my favorite airtime moments out there. After my rides in July of 2023, I realized I prefer this coaster to any B&M hyper coaster, and even many coasters in my top 25, possibly even my top 10. I even think it rivals many of the elite roller coasters that have debuted in the past 10 years or so. While it may not be as aggressive as Skyrush at Hershey Park, or have as many airtime moments as Steel Vengeance at Cedar Point, it offers a mix of design styles that not every new coaster manages to do. And that's also because the ride offers a ride duration you rarely find in a new roller coaster. But I say the ride is nearly perfect because the ride's trains aren't the best and the restraints are downright awful. But personally,
personally, they do not bother me nearly as much as other enthusiasts, and I find the hate for them overblown. When the restraint isn't pressed too tightly against me, I find their ride quite comfortable. And even if I do get stapled, I don't find it to be the end of the world. I only find them painful after riding Superman several times in a row due to the ride's strong airtime. But I also find other rides with powerful airtime to be equally painful after many rides. What I'd recommend to any coaster enthusiast watching is to go ride Superman on a hot summer day without any bias or judgment beforehand. Just experience it for what it is. There's a reason the ride won so many awards in the 2000s. That award-winning experience is still baked into the ride's DNA. And if you get past the awful restraints, you'll notice it just like I did. I also used to believe the new trains run much slower than the originals, but I can now confidently say this most likely isn't true. My rides this July were ferociously fast, and based on many other videos filmed over the years, the ride was running just as fast in those videos as it did for me. I think the problem is that I always rode Superman early in the season when it wasn't very hot outside. And just like El Toro at Great Adventure or Millennium Force at Cedar Point, Superman the Ride seems to take some time before it runs at full speed, which is also understandable given how long its layout is. I also hear that the park began operating Superman with new wheels sometime around 2019 that have helped it run much faster than previously. The common discussion point around Superman is that it needs new trains or new restraints, but unfortunately this is probably much easier said than done. Not only is it expensive, but Massachusetts is very uptight with this roller coaster. In an ideal world, the park's best option is to do exactly what Darien Lake did for Ride of Steel in 2016. Ride of Steel had also operated with Frankenstein T-Bars since the New England accident in 2004, so Darien Lake purchased a brand new train from Intamin that was nearly identical to the ride's original trains. They feature the same rounded body designs and rows with different seat spacing, even when Intamin had moved away from that train design over a decade prior. One major upgrade is that the trains feature Intamin's newest T-Bar restraint design with a curved center shaft that allows for better contact with riders' upper thighs. This new train runs perfectly on Ride of Steel at Six Flags Darien Lake, but this wouldn't work for New England as Massachusetts has implemented some sort of ban on the use of T-Bars on Superman the Ride. As I discussed before, this is unfortunate as the T-Bar itself isn't why Stanley Morbarski tragically lost his life in 2004. Intamin have even used their T-Bars as recently in 2017's Lightspeed at Visionland in China. Morbarski's death was because Intamin were negligent in the length of Superman's seatbelts, and the ride crew was negligent in allowing Morbarski to ride when he wasn't properly secured by the T-Bar. With Ride of Steel's new train, that accident is not possible. Every seat has a seatbelt of proper length to measure riders, and there is a verify that ensures all restraints are low enough for the largest possible guest. The only other factor is making sure the ride crew is trained well enough to know when guests shouldn't ride if they lack certain extremities, but that applies to any roller coaster. I'm sure the park has tried to reason with Massachusetts about this dilemma, and I'd also guess that Massachusetts will not budge on their decision. If they rejected the U-Bars Bizarro was meant to open with, they could reject almost anything else. Tokyo Dome in Japan recently purchased new trains from Intamin for Thunder Dolphin, which is another Intamin mega coaster. but I don't know if these trains would work well on Superman the Ride. From what I understand, Intamin's newest generation trains like the new fleet on Thunder Dolphin or Pantheon at Busch Gardens Williamsburg are heavier than Intamin's prior trains. I would assume this is why Thunder Dolphin's new trains are only five cars long instead of six cars long like the originals. If New England were to purchase these new trains for Superman, the park would probably have to reduce the number of cars each train operated with, which would drop the rider capacity and also change the dynamics of the ride. I happen to prefer Superman in the back car. The whip of the first drop is fantastic, as well as many of the ride's other hills, and this might not be the same with a shorter train. Intamin's newest trains may also be more top-heavy, as not only does the restraint connect to the top of the seat instead of the floor, but the hydraulic cylinders are located in the seats themselves. This works fine on Intamin's newer coasters that feature heartlining, but we've seen how Superman tracks its unheartlined layout with heavier trains. Intamin's newest trains are also wider than what Superman operated with, and Thunder Dolphin saw the addition of guards on the side of each row to help with clearance issues. Thus, Superman the Ride could require the same guards if these trains were adopted. I've heard rumors that the park has been in talks with Intamin to purchase new trains for Superman, but it's nothing solidified and could result in nothing, especially with Massachusetts being the way it is. Ideally, the ride would be best if the park purchased the same train that Darien Lake did for Ride of Steel, but that's not likely due to the T-Bar, so I'd reason that unless Intamin can produce a bottom-heavy train with properly designed U-Bars that don't intrude on your leg and foot room, the park is probably better off just leaving Superman's trains as they 
are. Is that disappointing? Absolutely. But does that mean Superman is a bad ride? Heck no, it's amazing. That will do it for my longest video yet at over 15,500 words. For those of you who watched all the way until the end, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Superman the Ride has quite a fascinating story and I wanted to ensure its history was told as accurately as possible. If you haven't already, go to Six Flags New England and ride Superman. It is an epic roller coaster. And if you've already ridden Superman and it left you with a bad taste in your mouth, I'd highly recommend trying it again on a hot summer day with a more open mind. The award-winning experience is still baked into the coaster's DNA. You just have to get past the ride's awful restraints. Alright, thanks for watching everyone and be sure to like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all in the next one. Peace.